the Ostomy Nurse Project. Hello listeners and welcome to another exciting episode of the Ostomy Nurse Project. I am Felicity, your host, and in this week's episode, we are talking about high output stomas. And this is an important episode because it's something that we deal with both in a hospital and a community setting. So either after post-surgery in the immediate post-operative phase, or even long-term once you are at home after having your stoma formed. So in this episode, we're going to be covering a few different things. We'll be explaining what exactly is a high output stoma, how many people are affected by this condition, how we detect this type of condition, and what are the causes of a high output stoma. Then we're going to follow on and talk about the treatment and management once we've discovered what it is that's causing the problem, how we manage that both at home and in hospital. So what you as a person with a stoma or looking after someone with a stoma can do to treat this problem and what nurses and healthcare professionals can do in a hospital setting if it becomes unmanageable. And then we're going to be looking at a little bit of patient advice as to what to do if you suspect that you or somebody that you know is experiencing high output from their stoma. So starting out with this podcast, I also want to make mention that a high output stoma refers to somebody with a bowel stoma, so either an ileostomy of sorts or a colostomy where the output is fecal because those with a urostomy, their bowel is separate. And so if they are having episodes of diarrhea or or loose bowel actions, that's considered different. A high output stoma pertains to stomas of the bowel. And then it's also important to differentiate between a couple of definitions. When we talk about high output stomas, we are talking about volume of the output as opposed to the consistency of the output. So you can have loose output from your stoma, whether it's an ileostomy or a colostomy, the consistency of your feces can vary. So for instance, if you are a person, and I'll give you a couple of examples, if you're a person who has eaten something a bit funny that's upset your stomach, you may find that the consistency from your stoma becomes quite loose and watery. That's a consistency issue. Also, if you have got a bowel infection, so um, an enteritis of some sort, the same thing can happen. A bit like a gastro bug, you can have loose consistency, but the volume may not change. For people who are undergoing chemotherapy or for people who might be going through bowel preparation for a procedure where you are drinking solution to evacuate the bowel, the consistency of what comes out will be very watery. Now, That is a question of consistency, but when we talk high output stomas, we're referring to the volume or the amount that actually comes out because you can have one or the other or both. So you can have simply loose consistency of your output, but combined with high volumes of fluid output, you may tip into the realm of a high output stoma. So it's important to differentiate between the two of those. And in the incidences of high output stomas, we usually or commonly will see it in those who have an ileostomy. So ileostomies are associated with additional problems. And high output stomas are one of the most clinically relevant complications of having a stoma formed. So the normal, and I'm going to talk about this in a minute, but the normal output of a stoma can vary largely from anywhere from 500 mils right up to two liters per day. And that depends on the amount of liquids and the amount of food digested and the volume of the secretions from the gastrointestinal system. Um, And I'll talk about the actual definition of high output stomas in a minute, but the fact that there's such a variance in the amount that comes out, there's no clinical significance of a high output stoma until it starts to affect morbidity or when it starts to affect the person. And that happens, we consider it a high output stoma when it causes significant adverse effects such as dehydration, electrolyte imbalance, renal failure, and malnutrition. And so these problems are more likely to occur when the output exceeds the higher levels, but complications can also occur with much lower stoma output. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So because the stoma output or stoma effluent is very rich in fluids and particularly sodium or salt, dehydration and 
hyponatremia, so low salt levels, are the first symptoms when people experience high output stomas. Further complications to this include hypomagnesemia, so low magnesium, hypokalemia, which is low potassium, and eventually renal failure and malnutrition, so drastic weight loss. And depending on when this occurrence happens, so immediately after stoma formation, so what we call early onset of high output stoma is considered less than three weeks after the initial ostomy surgery. And then you can also have late high output stoma, which is greater than three weeks after surgery. So it's something that can happen immediately postoperatively, or it's something that can happen later on down the track also. So high output stomas are what we consider a precursor to dehydration, acute renal injury or renal failure if it is left unmanaged. And this is the issue. With enough volume coming out of your stoma, you are losing precious fluids and electrolytes, which can cause you to become severely dehydrated and cause the kidneys to become very upset uh, and not work efficiently if that dehydration is not rectified quickly. Now, problems with high output from stomas occurs in up to 17 to 20% of people who have a bowel stoma and up to 43 to 45% of readmissions to hospital for people with a stoma is due to dehydration or renal impairment as a result of high output or fluid losses from the stoma. So that's actually quite significantly high up to almost half of readmissions to hospital are for dehydration and high output from bowel stomas. So it's a problem that's quite unfortunately common, but it's something that we need to get onto very quickly because if not treated initially with proper fluid rehydration and electrolyte replacement, you can uh, become very sick very quickly and end up in hospital where we would treat you the same way anyway to replace the fluids that have been lost. So how do we know exactly what is considered high output from a stoma? It's very difficult to say because there is no concise definition of a high output stoma in terms of volume in the literature. It varies between facility and from country to country. But high output stomas are generally defined as equal to or greater than 1,500 mils of volume output from a stoma for two consecutive days. So it's ongoing. It's not just a short period of high output stoma. It is where it is consistently high volumes coming out of a stoma for greater than 24 hours. Now, it's very difficult to define that as being 1.5 liters on the dot because some people can be um, unaffected by those volumes coming out of their stoma. They may not be symptomatic of these fluid losses, And concurrently, people who um, have less than 1,500 mils out of their stoma, they may only have 800 to a litre out of their stoma, but that may cause significant fluid and electrolyte deficits in their body, depending on their body makeup, how they are metabolizing fluids. And so it's hard to specify what's considered high output, but the general consensus is if it is affecting the patient considerably with these types of volumes around 1500 mils for longer than 24 hours, we could consider that as being a high output stoma situation that is in need of rectification. And so in order to treat a high output stoma case, we need to identify and essentially treat the cause of what's causing such high fluid output volumes from the stoma in the first place. And there's many different causes that can contribute to a high output stoma. And I'll go through some of them with you now. One of the first causes that may contribute to a high output stoma is gastrointestinal infections. So in a hospital setting, these are things like C. diff, norovirus, gastroenteritis. So an infection of the bowel that can cause swelling and uh, essentially the bowel gets upset and stops absorbing fluids because it becomes inflamed as the inflammatory response trying to treat those infectious causes. And whilst we're on infections, sepsis is also a very large cause of a high output stoma, particularly in the post-operative phase. So usually just after surgery, if there's any sort of intra-abdominal sepsis or collection uh, that is generating an inflammatory response, it will have the same effect as those bowel infections. Sepsis creates an inflammatory response, 
which is going to inflame the inner lining of the mucosa of the bowel, and that's going to prevent proper fluid absorption, which will cause a high output of volume of fluid from the stoma itself. So when we talk about sepsis, that can be perhaps one of the causes of having the stoma formed in the first place, if there's been bowel perforations or intra-abdominal collections or diverticular abscess, those sorts of things can cause intra-abdominal infections. And with those infections, the natural inflammatory response of the body is to swell up to try and send white blood cells to combat that infection. And that's where we get that edema and That's where we get the absence of proper fluid absorption through the bowel mucosa and we get large volumes of high output from stomas as a response to sepsis in the abdomen. And this inflammatory response can also be responsible for high output volumes from a stoma, especially in people who have inflammatory bowel disease. So they're all connected with this inflammation cycle. So ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, other inflammatory bowel diseases They're causing that swelling of the bowel and the prevention of the proper absorption of fluids. It's the same process. Any of these conditions, inflammatory bowel disease, sepsis, uh, GI infections, they are all causing that swelling and that inflammatory response. Chemotherapy is also a big one that can cause an inflammatory response in the form of what we call mucositis. So for patients who are undergoing chemotherapy treatment, depending on the administration of that drug, they can develop irritation of the delicate mucosa of the bowel. Unfortunately, that's one of the side effects of these selective drugs to treat chemotherapy. These drugs are designed to selectively target highly proliferating or high high levels of growth cells and because the inner lining of our bowel is designed to continuously reproduce and create new cells because of that shearing force of feces going through it chemotherapy does often affect the inner lining of the bowel and it causes this mucositis so situs is inflammation of the inner lining and again that's going to prevent fluid absorption and that will cause high output volumes from a stoma. Not in all cases, but it is certainly a contributing factor to a high output stoma. If you are a person who is undergoing chemotherapy with a stoma, you may or may not have experienced this uh, high fluid volume. And then there are some other general risk factors. So comorbid conditions like diabetes, um, the neuropathy or the nerve damage can affect the gut and the associated nausea and vomiting that some people with diabetes can get particularly around the operative phase. So if people are new to a stoma, if they've just had their stoma surgery and one of their coexisting morbidities is diabetes, they may develop some nausea and some vomiting to do with some of the medications that they've got, as well as the nerve damage to the areas surrounding the gut. So they may find that they have higher incidences of high output from their stoma if they are diabetic. And low albumin is also another condition, and that might cause intestinal edema. That's something that we would test for in your blood levels, either immediately after your surgery if you're new to having a stoma, or even if you are readmitted to hospital uh, in the post-operative phase with high output from your stoma. When we check your bloods, which I'm going to talk about in just a minute, when we talk about hospital management, um, they would check your albumin levels because low-level albumin can contribute to swelling and inflammation in the intestines and that can also cause that high fluid volume output from your stoma. And also just quickly to run off certain conditions that are associated with electrolyte and fluid imbalances, things like parathyroid or thyroid disorders, existing renal disease, so existing kidney disease, alcohol abuse or liver cirrhosis can all contribute to electrolyte uh, malfunction and imbalances as well. Now, there are certain medications that can cause high output stomas as well. When I was just talking about diabetes, there are medications that some people may be on that can cause high fluid volume outputs. So the most obvious ones are what we call prokinetics. Now, for people that don't know the medical terminology, that's things like your anti-nausea, anti-vomiting drugs, stimulating your motility drugs of your bowel. So things like metoclopramide, which is Maxilon, if those of you who have heard of Maxilon or even taken Maxilon before to stop you from feeling nauseated, that can have an adverse effect on your bowel motility and it can cause you to have loose or even high output from your stoma. 
Laxatives are another one, obviously. They seem obvious, but sometimes we might not consider that some laxatives can contribute to the fluid output from the intestine. And even some uh, drugs like erythromycin, which are primarily used as antibiotics, but can also be used to increase bowel motility. That can have a significant effect on the bowel output, particularly with a stoma. There are certain processes with ceasing or stopping medications very quickly, things like if you've been on doses of steroids for a period of time and then they are abruptly ceased, that can uh, upset the bowel and cause it to swell temporarily, which might cause some fluid output or fluid losses. And going back to diabetes, taking the drug metformin, uh, which is a drug that a lot of diabetics take to uh, maintain their blood glucose levels, that can even have an effect on bowel motility as well. Um, It can change absorption rates of fatty acids and things like that, which can cause fluid abnormalities um, or a disbalance in the fluid output from your stoma as well. So there are medications that can increase the output from your stoma, just as the same as there are medications that can decrease the amount of fluid coming out of your stoma. And again, we'll talk about that in a minute when we talk about management of fluid outputs from the stoma. And then the only other factor that I wanted to mention are things like bowel obstructions or uh, pelvic collections around the bowel. Any external pressure um, from either scarification or a buildup of fluid inside the abdomen can put pressure on the bowel. And if the bowel is trying to work to push fecal fluid through, but there are obstructions in the way, that can cause what we call an overflow of fluid. So you're not getting fecal output per se, but you are getting high fluid volumes trying to push through from the pressure exerted on the bowel itself. And that can be another contributing factor to a high output stoma. So what do we do about these high output stomas? And I think it's important to talk about what you at home can do to try and manage this condition and prevent yourself from becoming dehydrated um, or going into renal injury or renal failure if you cannot manage it at home. And then I want to talk about what we do in the hospital. So if it does get into a situation where you are that unwell that you require hospitalization, I'm going to talk to you about what we do to manage those fluid losses in a hospital setting. And I think it's important to know that if you are going to try and treat high fluid volume outputs from your stoma, it's important to know what's normal and what's not normal. Because if you're at home and you're not sure whether it's just a loose consistency from your output or whether you might be becoming dehydrated and unwell as a result of some other contributing factor, then you're going to need to know how to treat it and recognize it effectively. Because not knowing what's normal and what's not normal can be very confusing for people. And when I start talking about what's normal and what's not normal, I'm going to be referring in this instance to people who have an ileostomy. You can still have high output from a colostomy, But I think in terms of monitoring stoma output, the incidences of high output seem to affect ileostomies significantly more than a colostomy. And that's because of the absorption rate of the small intestine compared to the large intestine and the complications that can occur with an ileostomy or a stoma of the small bowel. So what's normal? A normal ileostomy appliance should be emptied anywhere between four to six times a day. And your consistency should be relatively thick. And I'm really sorry because I'm going to ruin some foods for people here. But when I talk consistency, I like to say there's three types of consistency. At best, we see toothpaste consistency. So a very good soft paste-like consistency that comes out of the stoma that you would empty perhaps four to six times a day. Medium consistency might be like a soup or a porridge consistency where it's a little bit watery, but we aim for like a soup kind of consistency. And a poor consistency is considered liquid, like broth, water, diarrhea. So very watery, loose output with not a lot of substance to it, no thickened parts to it. I'm sorry for people at home. Here's your wonderful ostomy nurse talking to you about fecal consistencies. This is what we get paid for. And if you can't talk to us about it, well, who can talk about it? So the ideal consistency that we look for is either like thick porridge or toothpaste consistency. And to maintain that consistency, you should be at home eating little meals and eating them often. 
Um, and in conjunction with that, you should be aiming to drink your two liters of fluid per day. Now, what fluid makes up that two liters is different for everybody. It doesn't have to be just water. It should be a combination of water, tea, coffee, juice, dairy, mineral waters, soft drinks, anything that's in fluid form, as long as it's had in moderation and not excessively, uh, you should be trying to get your two liters of fluid in per day. And some of that fluid may even be made up from the foods that we eat. There are high fluid foods, things like fluidy fruits, watermelon, grapes, those sorts of things are very high in fluid. So you can obtain that through foods as well and not just liquids but it's important to keep hydrated that way. So if you are going through your normal day, you are eating little meals and eating them often without any nausea or vomiting, and you're able to tolerate good volumes of fluid up to two liters and still be able to empty your bag four to six times a day with that nice soupy, porridgey, toothpaste type consistency, that's considered relatively normal. What's not normal or what may be required to address in terms of starting to lose fluid output is if you are emptying your bag more than six times per day or if you're having to empty it very frequently. If you're emptying your pouch and it's filling up within half an hour to an hour and you're having to empty it again, that's a signal that things might not be functioning normally. The consistency will also change. So if your output is very watery, uh, with not many solid particles to it. If you are having to empty watery output for longer than 12 hours, so longer than a day, that may need addressing with fluid and electrolyte replacement. If you are going longer than 24 hours with this problem where you are constantly emptying high fluid volumes from your pouch, you will likely need some sort of medical intervention, either in the form of hospitalization or medications and fluid and electrolyte replacements, which you may choose to start doing at home before you have to go to hospital. Now, one of the really good ways to monitor this at home, if you are a person with a stoma or if you are a person who's looking after somebody who has a stoma and you're concerned about the consistency or the volume of what's coming out, then it's important to start tracking it. You can do that on an ostomy output tracking piece of paper or a stoma diary, there are phone apps out now that you can track stoma output or you can simply get a measuring container and when you are emptying the stoma output, make sure you measure and jot down how much is coming out. But the ostomy output tracking measures also um, contain an area for you to monitor the intake as well as the output. So you can actually look at what fluids you are putting in and what fluids are coming out. They're a really good way of monitoring your input versus your output which is also a good way of going back over and seeing whether your output is outweighing your input of fluid. And that would be a good indication that your patient or whoever you're looking after, or if it's you yourself, that you might be getting dehydrated because you're losing larger volumes of fluid than you can put in. Now, what does dehydration feel like uh, for those of you who are at home? I spoke about this in the dehydration conversation episode. So if you want to, you can backtrack and re-listen to that one. But I'll just touch over it again. You may be dehydrated if you have a dry, sticky mouth, if you have increased thirst, if you are feeling lightheaded or dizzy, especially when you go to stand up from a sitting position. You might feel tired. You might experience headaches. You might be uh, developing muscle cramps, cramping in the legs and arms may be an indication that you are losing electrolytes and that you are becoming dehydrated. So what do we do about these fluid losses? If you've been going for longer than 24 hours and you are having to empty larger volumes of fluid output from your stoma and you've been measuring it and you are losing more fluids than you are able to take in, Here's the sorts of things that you might want to do at home or that you are able to do at home that you can try before you contact a health professional or your stomal therapy nurse or your doctor for further advice and treatment. So at this point, what you want to do is you want to increase your sodium or your salt intake and adjust your fluid levels um, by drinking certain types of fluids to limit the amount of fluid that you are losing from your stoma, but increase the amount of electrolytes that you are retaining. So that means adding salt to your drinks or your foods. And there are high sodium foods and drinks that you can have. So things like beef broth 
or, or broth type soups are quite high in salt and you can add salt to them and they can be easier to get down because they are a liquid. So if you're not feeling particularly well, sometimes soups and broths can be easier to get down than a full solid meal. Canned vegetables are also a source of higher sodium because they put sodium in the, in the preservative liquid that they're stored in when they're canned. So you could eat those. And things like certain juices, tomato juice is actually high in sodium. But just be careful with tomato juice because it can be quite acidic and it can upset the tummy a bit. So if you are a bit sensitive to tomato and the acids in tomato, try and avoid that because it may actually contribute to your high output. So try and get something salty in that will help you to reduce your electrolyte losses. At this point, you also need to restrict your oral intake of what we call hypo and hypertonic fluids to 500 mils to a liter. Now, what are these fluids? Hypotonic fluids are low salt fluids. That includes water. Um, So what we want to do is you want to restrict your just water intake to between 500 mils to one liter in a day. Drinking too much plain water can actually contribute further to your dehydration because it's going to draw salt out of your body as opposed to pulling water into the cells. So you want to restrict your water intake to half a litre to a litre in a 24-hour period. What you want to do, though, is implement an oral rehydration solution to make up for that fluid depletion. So I've talked about it before with St. Mark's solution, but just to reiterate and touch over it again quickly, it's 20 grams of sugar, 3.5 grams of salt, and 2.5 grams of sodium bicarb in one liter of water. So you can mix that up yourself. Otherwise, you can get um, oral rehydration solution from your pharmacist. So that's hydrolyte, gastrolyte, pediolyte, depending on where you're listening from. And you can mix that up into one liter volumes and drink that instead of water. That will assist with reducing your fluid losses and it will help to maintain your electrolyte balances in your body. You also want to have a diet consisting of moderate fats and complex carbohydrates. What does that mean? Get onto your starchy foods. So all the things that we've ever told you not to eat because they're refined and they're processed, we want you to eat those. So white breads, pasta, rice, cornbreads, anything with high starch contents, start to eat portions of that the starch will help to slow down bowel motility and it will help to uh, soak up some of that liquid. It's also easier to process um, and digest, which means if your bowel is a bit inflamed or swollen and it's having trouble absorbing nutrients, having easy to digest foods like these starches can be easier to pass through and they can help to resolve higher volumes of liquid output. What you want to reduce is your levels of fruits and green leafy vegetables because they are very high in fructose and they are very high in fiber. And that can be difficult to digest if you are experiencing high output from your stoma. So we do recommend that you reduce your fruit intake and your firm green leafy vegetables just temporarily to see if that helps with your fluid volumes. And then what you want to do is you want to actually stagger your eating and drinking. You don't want to eat and drink all together in one sitting. Try and limit your fluid intake whilst you're eating foods and then drink your fluids approximately 30 to 40 minutes after your meals. Sometimes differentiating between eating and drinking can be the difference between having excessive fluid outputs and having normal outputs from your stoma. And the reason being is if your bowel is struggling to try and digest and absorb nutrients from the food that you've eaten, washing it through with high fluid volumes can actually force that output through a bit quicker than what it would be used to if you were just eating foods or solids at that particular time. So that's one technique that you may want to try if you are finding that you are getting higher liquid volumes out of your stoma when you've been eating. Try and eat first And then after eating, drink your fluids. Separating the two may be the difference between experiencing fluid output volumes that are higher than normal, and that may solve the problem for you. You also want to observe the color of your urine. We can't forget urine after all of this because 
Urine is a really good indicator of how hydrated you are. And I've spoken about this in previous episodes about dehydration, particularly for people with a urostomy. And it's important to observe the color and consistency of your urine. If your urine is very dark, if it's dark orange, dark yellow, dark brown, that is a good indication that you are already dehydrated. Not that you're becoming dehydrated, but that you are already lacking the fluid volumes that you need to maintain your electrolyte levels and your fluid volumes and your blood volumes. So if your urine is still quite yellow and pale, you are not out of the woods completely, but you should be drinking adequate amounts of fluids to maintain that color of your urination. If your urine is dark, that is a sign that you are dehydrated and that you need to fix those fluid imbalances as soon as possible. And that's done with your limiting of just pure water and implementing your oral rehydration fluids. So your hydrolyte or your gastrolyte mixed into one liter of water and drink that over a 24 hour period. Now, the only other thing that I'll suggest as an external treatment from coming into hospital is the use of drug therapy. Now, I don't say drug therapy lightly. I mean that there is one particular medication that you can obtain without a prescription that is available from the pharmacy or your supermarket, and that is what we call loperamide, otherwise known as gastrostop. Um, it may come under several other brand names, but the primary ingredient is loperamide. And that is a drug that you can take over the counter to help slow down the bowel motility. And that will help to stall the level of fluids that are coming out of your stoma. And it may help to reduce the severity and the volume of heavy output from your stoma. Now, I do always caution if you are concerned about taking an over-the-counter medication, if you have any medical conditions that you are not sure if it will interact with gastrostop, please consult your doctor or your stomal therapy nurse or a pharmacist before you just go taking these drugs. But they are available over the counter. They are generally quite safe. And we usually suggest starting with one tablet before each meal. So one tablet before breakfast, one tablet before lunch, and one tablet before uh, dinner. And that may help to decrease the volume of fluid coming out of your stoma. There are adjustments that you can make to the um, amount of tablets that you take or the concentration of those tablets, whether you take one or two tablets or whether you only take them in the morning or in the evening. If you are concerned about that, you can talk to your specialist or your doctor about that. But generally speaking, if you start with one tablet morning, afternoon and evening, that may help to reduce the fluid losses from your stoma. Now, there are other drugs that can be implemented to help reduce your fluid losses, but at this stage, they are drugs that require prescription. You used to be able to get codeine phosphate over the counter. However, they are now via prescription only. And other drugs like omeprazole, so Nexium, Pantoprazole, Somac, uh, these drugs require a prescription. But loperamide does not require a prescription. So if you are trying to manage your fluid losses at home from your stoma, it is advisable to get some gastrostop from the supermarket or your pharmacist. So that pretty much sums up management of higher output stomas when you are at home before you have to come to hospital. So as a summary, avoid high fiber foods that contain seeds, nuts, skins, which is your dark green leafy vegetables, firm veggies, those sorts of things. Cut those out completely. Increase your starches, so your pasta, your white rice, mashed potato, those types of foods will help to slow down your output and add salt to foods um, so that you are retaining those electrolytes, adding salt to your foods and your drinks. You also want to avoid drinking large amounts of plain water, squash, tea or coffee. Limit those if you're experiencing high output um, and switch directly to your oral rehydration solution, which is your St. Mark solution or your gastrolyte, mixing it up into one liter of water and drinking that over a 24 hour period. Make sure you're monitoring your input and your output on a stoma diary chart and also check the color of your urine to make sure that you're not already dehydrated. If you are feeling unwell at any point, get in touch with your stomal therapy nurse or your specialist because you may require treatment by a medical professional or even in severe cases require hospitalization. And we're going to talk about that now. What happens if you do happen to end up in hospital with high output from your stoma? Now, as nurses, we tend to treat high output stomas in different stages. There is first line treatment 
If that does not produce the results that we want, we can then go on to second line or stage two treatment. And again, if that fails after a period of time, we can then go to a third line of treatment. So we don't like to throw everything at you all at once. We treat it in stages. And so one of the first things that we do as nurses is we determine on your admission whether your high output is regarded as early high output or late high output. And as I said before, that's whether you are in the first three weeks after your stoma surgery or whether this is a latent occurrence, whether you've had your stoma for longer than three weeks. And so this is uh, something that might be related to other issues. And then we have to, of course, detect or establish what the actual underlying cause is of that high output. So before initiating any sort of pharmacological treatment or replacing your nutrition or anything like that, we need to figure out what it is that's causing it in the first place. So that can be things like testing for, as I said, gastrointestinal infections, so Clostridium difficile or C. diff, norovirus, salmonella, those sorts of things. And we can do that through stool testing, um, urine testing, blood testing, we can establish if that's some sort of bowel infection. We can check to see if it's related to medications, so we can see what medications you are currently taking, whether it's prokinetics, so Maxilon, whether it's to do with diabetic medications, um, fluid pills, uh, laxatives, those sorts of drugs uh, may be contributing to it. Corticosteroids, uh, any of those we will take into account when we are looking at the reasons for your high output stoma. Bowel obstructions, you may be referred for either a CT or an X-ray or some sort of scan or testing to determine whether you've got a blockage in your bowel and that's whether it's either an early high output stoma or a later high output stoma. Obstructions can happen at any point. So that may be something that we will test for if we suspect that you might have a blockage. Intra-abdominal sepsis we'll also test for and we usually do that in the form of a blood test to see if your inflammatory markers are raised. Um, and that might indicate to us that you've got some sort of infection brewing. Inflammatory bowel disease, if you are a person who has had your stoma due to inflammatory bowel disease, we may uh, test you for that or we may examine your bowel, again, either through a scan or a scope or a simple blood test to look at inflammatory markers to determine whether it's an exacerbation of that condition. And then we look for things like uh, more severe cases like short bowel syndrome. And short bowel syndrome is simply where you've had that much of your small intestine removed that there's not enough length to absorb adequate amounts of nutrients um, and water. So there are some people who do suffer from that condition, particularly if they have a stoma very high up in the small intestine. So for instance, in the jejunum or in the upper part of the ileum. And then we can obviously establish what treatment is required. And the treatment initially in stage one treatment is roughly the same. Um, but as nurses and medical professionals, we'll do several things to look at reducing your fluid losses and your electrolyte losses. That's something that we can get onto fairly soon. So, and this is what I'm specifying here is not uh, the same for every facility. Treatment might vary depending on where you're from or where you are being treated or the type of facility that you are in at the time. But this is just a generalized guide as to the interventions that we can provide if you do get admitted to hospital with a high output stoma. So we generally restrict your fluid intake to 500 mils to one liter a day. So that's your oral fluid intake because what we do is we perform intravenous hydration. So we hook you up to an IV and we rehydrate you and increase your blood volume levels and your electrolyte levels via IV instead, particularly if you've been uh, quite unwell, if you've had nausea and vomiting due to dehydration, um, intravenous rehydration is a good way to supplement that. But we will restrict your fluid intake to about a litre a day. We also recommend isotonic drinks, as I mentioned before, hydrolyte, gastrolyte, pedialyte, any of those oral rehydration solutions, we will switch you to that and just that instead of water. So avoid tea, coffee, alcohol, fruit juices, avoid all other liquids, including water, and just restrict you to the isotonic drinks, so the uh, electrolyte replacement fluids. We will also generally uh, prescribe loperamide, approximately two milligrams, so that might be one tablet, two tablets, and we would recommend having that before breakfast, lunch, dinner, and nighttime. So that's one of the frontline treatments that we can suggest and start you off on to try and slow down that bowel motility and get you reabsorbing some fluids again. 
We put you on a strict fluid balance chart. Nurses were all well aware of a fluid balance chart. It's basically the same as a stoma diary, uh, just a clinical version. And we check your body weight, so we'll probably also weigh you so that we can determine whether you are gaining or losing weight as a result of the treatment that we're giving. Because if you are able to be rehydrated adequately, you will actually gain weight from water weight because you will be um, increasing your blood volume again. We'll also look at blood tests, so blood analysis including your electrolytes, specifically magnesium, calcium, phosphates, um, potassium and sodium. So that, that's all done through a blood test. And we'll also start you on oral or uh, IV supplementation of electrolytes if that's necessary, depending on those blood results too. And another thing that we might do initially is if you are a person who is admitted with late high output from your stoma. So if you are not in the first three weeks after your operation, we would probably check your vitamin B12 levels as well um, because there are certain types of surgeries or certain results from having a small bowel stoma that can um, reduce your absorption of vitamin B12, but not in all cases. But that might be something that we will check for as well if you are admitted with late onset high output. And so this is the process that we will commence on for about 24 to 48 hours, sometimes even longer. So if these treatments are resolved and your high output does reduce, we will gradually start to increase your oral fluid intake, um, allowing you to start introducing normal fluids again. We would start um, some IV therapy to replace any electrolytes and we should do another blood analysis and that should tell us that your levels are normalizing. We can then also start to reduce the level of loperamide that we're giving you and start to get you back into your normal routine. However, if the high output does continue after 48 to 72 hours, we will then perform follow-up treatment. So what that essentially means is we will continue the fluid restriction of oral intake, limiting you to just the uh, electrolyte replacement fluids. And again, so that would be limited to 500 to 1,000 mils per day. So that's actually not quite a lot. That's almost just a litre of fluid in a 24-hour period. So we would restrict you to that much. We would consider increasing your loperamide dose. So we would double the dosage and see whether that is having any benefit to you as opposed to the initial dosing. So with loperamide, um, some recommendations will cap it at a maximum of 16 milligrams per day. There are some research um, papers to suggest that we can go even higher than that, but that would require um, probably stage three treatment uh, if nothing else is working, or they may even consider switching you to a different type of medication. Now, as a stage two treatment or a follow-up treatment, we can also start to implement other medications uh, with doctor's approval. So a doctor may prescribe omeprazole, um, which for any of you out there, that would be things like your Nexium or Somac is pantoprazole. We may suggest um, a doctor prescribing that in addition to the loperamide, and that can help to settle the stomach and reduce gastric secretions. That's a second line treatment that we may implement if the initial treatment with just loperamide is not having an effect on your high output. We would also start to implement input from a dietitian or a nutritionist who can look at the absorption rates of the foods that you are eating. We may suggest uh, implementing medications such as cholestyramine to help with fat malabsorption and um, bilious output and try and resolve that. It's not a common practice that we do over here, but that is an option in some cases. And then we also continue to monitor your fluids, your electrolyte balances if necessary, as with stage one or the front light treatment. And so again, we will follow this regime for approximately 48 hours. If we are still not seeing a result or a reduction in the volume of stoma output, we can then go to a stage three or a third line of treatment, which means if high output from your stoma persists, we evaluate the overall treatment plan and we can look at getting into a more complex case management for the patient at hand. And that involves things like uh, supplementing with uh, hydro and lipid soluble vitamins and minerals. We would maintain the low paramide dose um, at the given um, prescription and we would also consider adding things like codeine phosphate approximately 15 to 60 milligrams depending on what the doctor authorizes and we would implement that in addition 
to low pyramide before breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Now, that is contraindicated to use codeine if patients have creatinine clearance issues. That's a nursing term. If you guys don't understand it, don't worry about it. It's all to do with your kidney function and your, your blood levels. But if there's a reason that you are not suitable to receive codeine phosphate, then obviously the doctor will not prescribe it to you. Codeine is uh, has a similar effect to antidiarrheals, except that that's not its primary action, but it does have a constipating effect. And so in some instances, we can prescribe codeine in addition to low pyramide, and that sometimes does have an effect at reducing the bowel motility or the level of output from your stoma. Now, if fat malabsorption persists also, we can increase cholestyramine doses. If that is something that has been prescribed to you, it may not be, but that's also a third-line treatment that we can increase that medication for you. And ultimately, if the high output continues greater than two liters after two weeks, some cases require prescribing a drug called octreotide. And octreotide can be administered for short-term purposes only. It does Its efficacy is not great if it's prescribed for longer than, say, a week to two weeks at the most. If no improvement from octreotide is obtained, then they actually stop octreotide. It is a drug that essentially dries up um, a lot of the mucous membranes. It's known as a somatostatin, and it will reduce secretions from mucosa significantly so in a fancy terms you know for those of you who are at home and listening it basically dries you up from the inside out and we do that if all else fails it's not a first line treatment because of the type of drug that it is and so we often keep it as a last resort if all other interventions are unsuccessful and then whilst these three stages of treatment are ongoing, there are specific nutritional treatments that we do along all stages of this. And I've mentioned them before. It also includes avoiding fluid intake during meals. So restricting your fluids until after you've eaten. So approximately 30 minutes to 40 minutes after your meals before implementing fluids. We might advise you to temporarily increase your salt content. So adding salt to your foods or eating salty foods, and that can help promote fluid reabsorption. And ultimately, whilst these treatments are ongoing, we would be measuring what's coming out and we would be liaising with your doctor and yourself as the patient, as well as the multidisciplinary team. So dietitians, stomal therapy nurses, doctors, nurses, um, all to get that high output to resolve and reduce to a level that is manageable for you again and to prevent you from becoming dehydrated and losing more fluids and electrolytes. Now, there is one treatment that I haven't mentioned that I've sort of reserved till last minute because it's something that we may not consider when we have high output from our stomas, and that is the use of stomal therapy interventions such as high output bags or larger bags that can accommodate large fluid volume losses. And so when you are first being seen by a stomal therapy nurse, if you're a person who has a stoma that's quite new, or if you're a person who has had your stoma for a long time, you may or may not be aware that there are pouching options that can accommodate large volumes of fluid. Now, it doesn't matter the reason for your high output. High output bags are available to you if you are suffering from this problem. If you are fortunate enough to uh, be able to stay at home and manage high output yourself without too much trouble and without the need to be hospitalized, you can obtain high output bags either by contacting your stomal therapy nurse or your company that you or the brand of pouching that you use may have a high output option in their portfolio. So you could either check with the company to see if they do supply a high output bag, whether they would be able to sample one for you and send you one out to try. If they don't sample a high output system, you could contact your stomal therapy nurse who may have access to one for you. And worst case scenario, your stomal therapy nurse could give you the ordering codes to order from your monthly supply. The issue with that is that it would negate your usual order though, because high output systems can only be ordered approximately 20 bags in a month. And if you are ordering 20 high output bags per month, you are unable to order your say 30 drainables or your 90 closed bags or your 60 closed bags, depending on what it is. So there are restrictions on having to order 
high output systems. So it's always advisable if you do have high or loose output from your stoma, contact your stomal therapy nurse or contact your association or contact the brand of company that you use so that they may be able to offer you a high output solution. And you could temporarily wear that pouch to accommodate for those high fluid losses, which means that you're not having to go to the bathroom and drain or empty or change your bag as frequently. So as an example, if you were a person who has high output from your ileostomy and you are using, say, perhaps a midi size or a medium sized drainable bag, if you have a high output from your stoma, there's the potential to be emptying that anywhere up to every half an hour to an hour or perhaps emptying it eight to ten times a day. And then you have to consider the amount of times that you would have to wake up during the night to empty it. So having a high output appliance option is a great idea so that you can wear a bigger bag. It's not pretty, I have to tell you, but it will certainly accommodate higher fluid losses to at least allow you to sleep through the night without having to get up and it will avoid instances of the bag bursting off from becoming too full. The other advantage of these high output bags is that they have the ability for an additional long bag to be attached. And I have spoken about high output bags before in the Pouching Options podcast. If you want to go back, you can listen to that again. But in general, the high output bags are larger um, to accommodate higher fluids anyway, but they usually have a plug or a tap function at the end, which means you can attach another long bag to it, which has the capacity to cope to up to two liters of output during a nighttime or during a daytime. If you're quite unwell and you cannot make it up to the bathroom that many times to empty your bag, you can certainly attach a long bag. So these appliances are available in hospital and it's often a treatment that your stomal therapy nurse will provide for you if you are hospitalized because obviously the long bags have got measurement abilities on it too. So the nursing staff can monitor your fluid losses through a high output appliance as well. So if that's something that you would need to explore, if you want to talk to somebody about having a high output option, if you are somebody who's either experienced high output from your stoma or you are about to undergo treatment that may predispose you to developing high output from your stoma, certainly get in touch with your stomal therapy nurse to discuss options for a high output pouch. Well, that's pretty much it for today, everybody. I think I've covered everything to do with the establishment of identifying and managing high output stomas. Whether or not you are a person who has an ileostomy or a colostomy, it is something that may or may not happen to you throughout the course of your stoma life, whether your stoma is temporary or permanent. And I hope I've given you some insight into the options for trying to prevent high output from your stoma at home, what to do if you do experience high output from your stoma, and what happens if you do inevitably have to be hospitalized to treat this common condition that happens in some people with a stoma. Join us again next week for another enthralling episode of the Ostomy Nurse Project. If you like the content that you're listening to and you think I'm doing a good job, please feel free to leave a review or a comment on YouTube. You can rate us on Apple Podcasts or you can tune in through Spotify. We are also on Podbean, so there's lots of different mediums to give you access to the Ostomy Nurse Project. I am trying to get our podcast onto Google Podcasts, but I still don't think it's available in Australia yet. Sorry, everybody. And I just want to mention that we have been getting some comments from people all the way over in the UK. So thank you very much from around the world. For those of you who are listening, it's very much appreciated. And I appreciate your feedback because it makes me think that I'm actually telling you something that you want to hear instead of just talking about poos and wees to the big worldwide internet. So join us again next week. You've been listening to the Ostomy Nurse Project coming to you from down under, just like where your stoma is. See you next time. Bye.